Hello. How's everyone doing? Oh. All right, this is my first conference uh, since before COVID that I'm speaking at. Uh, really ex my, also my first time in Paris, so really, really excited to be here. Thank you all for coming to my talk. Um, <laughs> thank you. So this talk is a little different from most of my talks because normally I extol the virtues of Uniswap, uh, but today uh, we will be roasting Uniswap um, and also announcing something big, uh, which, is, which is exciting. So, you know, it all started with Uniswap v1, um, which, which we all know about, and I think that the big thing that Uniswap did is it introduced the ability for anyone to create liquidity for any token. And I think before that, you know, there was a lot of problems around listing, and it was hard to get your, your token listed on a centralized exchange, and also, even once you got listed, it was very difficult to create liquidity. So V1 was successful not because it was like the most efficient design, it was successful because it unlocked something new, uh, and, and uh, you know, allowed people to do something different. And that's why we have this sort of upwards chart. Uh, this is a little bit old, but um, just shows like how many tokens get added to the protocol. Now it's more like 200,000. Uh, this is from like maybe a year ago. Um, uh, but you know, Uniswap V1 had problems. Uniswap was inefficient, uh, inflexible, written by one amateur dev in a language no one used, uh, and I made up the feat here um, on a plane one day. And uh, I think what's you know, really important to think about here is just that like, you know, it forced all liquidity providers to use the same strategy, um, which wasn't a very efficient strategy. The vast majority of the funds in Uniswap V1 uh, never got used. Um, I, I mentioned the language because it wasn't very, like, it, it wasn't, a, you know, a lot of people didn't know how to build on top of it just because it was, it was written in a, in a new language. And I'm a fan of Viper. Um, uh, so Uniswap V2 came out um, and became this much bigger money Lego, uh, had much more adoption than V1, um, and an entire ecosystem formed around it. Um, uh, which, which we see, you know, what, th what that looked like back in the day. Um, uh, but it actually, funny enough, the, the new features that we introduced with Uniswap v2 actually did not get used. The, the main new feature was ERC-20, ERC-20 pairs, and uh, because it wasn't a, in a very efficient curve for stable coins, uh, people didn't really use it for stable coins, and everyone else just wanted to pair their tokens against ETH. The other features were like oracles, which were mostly used very poorly. Um, uh, and it actually did not fix V1's biggest problems, uh, which were like around flexibility and expressiveness and efficiency. Um, but, you know, it, it still was a, was a success in its own way. Uh, Uniswap V3 uh, came out, and I think that was a big breakthrough moment. Um, it made AMMs uh, extremely efficient, uh, you know, kind of, kind of for the, the, the first time in some ways. Um, and this is why we saw like the, the sort of market share go up, and we saw this, this market depth chart on the left uh, where we have Uniswap exceeding you know, the likes of Binance and Coinbase and, and Kraken, et cetera, on you know, the market depth. Uh, ironically, when we, when we put out this piece on, on the comparing the market depth, depth to centralized exchanges, uh, the reason we didn't claim it had the deepest liquidity in the world for ETHUSD uh, was because we couldn't get the data from FTX at the time. Uh, <laughs> turns out uh, you know, that was a sign. Um, so it, it was deepest liquidity in the world. And that's also why you've seen decentralized exchange uh, go up relative to centralized exchange, uh, you know, in, in like overall spot trading, um, is, is this sort of new efficiency that was introduced. Uh, but not without its problems. Um, you know, I think Uniswap v3 was actually very uh, complicated. Is, is it was and is, you know, quite complicated to build on top of, um, and has, you know, some issues around the competitiveness of liquidity providers against each other, potentially. Uh, we, we can unpack that. Um, and it was extremely opinionated. I, I think the important thing here is that, like, as the AMM development got more complex, it, you know, we started having to make much more complex trade-offs. And adding a new feature that was beneficial for some users would actually have a negative impact on other users. So the cap capital efficiency that enabled the efficient, like the, the sort of, you know, Uniswap to compete in the way that it did actually came up with a trade-off which was like, it's much more confusing to, to interact with as a developer. Um, so we entered this like opinionated trade-off space. Um, you know, uh, and, and that's where you get memes like this. Um, and so, like, what do, we, what do we do about that? Um, you know, this, this talk is not uh, a, a talk on Uniswap v4, uh, but, you know, quickly, there, there have been other ones, but, you know, just quickly, like, I think Uniswap v4 is really built to be, like, the ultimate DEX platform and allow people to choose the trade-offs that they want to make, um, which, you know, helps with, with, this, with this complex trade-off space. And so the ability to do, like, fully custom pools uh, with the introduction of hooks uh, you know, creates a really expressive system where you can, you know, create custom order types, dynamic fees, custom curves, et cetera. Um, and, and that's really powerful. Uh, I think one of the most interesting things is that, like, um, in, the, in sort of the uh, proliferation of other AMMs and other projects, um, 
you can tell that there's like a really uh, interesting area, like there's an interesting world to explore with, with uh, DEX innovation, um, but building an, an entire AMM from scratch, or an entire DEX from scratch, uh, has a lot more, it takes a lot more time and is, is a lot more um, uh, risky than building on top of hooks. And generally speaking, you know, the, the, the a single, you know, the shared single contract for all pools in Uniswap v4 also creates like an efficiency benefit, where if you build uh, a hook instead of a custom AMM, uh, outside of Uniswap, you get a gas efficiency benefit routing across all other pools. Uh, so there's sort of this like shared uh, benefit for building on top. And, and that's sort of the, the logic of, of v4 and what we did there. Um, however, uh, you know, even though the protocol is not out yet, it is not beyond roasting. Um, so I think that the main, uh, you know, the main problem we have with Uniswap v4 is that we actually managed to make liquidity fragmentation worse and routing even harder. Um, so, you know, uh, the way this works, right, v4 makes routing harder because it massively increases the number of liquidity pools that are available and increases the complexity of routing across them. Uh, you know, instead of there being, you know, one, uh, one or a few pairs per, uh, a few pools per pair, now there's like potentially infinite. And then the arbitrary logic that can be introduced by hooks also increases the, can increase the complexity of routing. So for example, if you have a pool that like requires some additional checks or, or moves the price in, a, in an unexpected way or something like that, uh, routers have to be aware of that. And so the, the problem of routing across many pools uh, gets harder and it actually was already extremely hard. Um, so why is the routing problem extremely hard? Uh, we have quite literally hundreds of thousands of, of liquidity pools at this point. Um, and uh, we have you know, multiple fee tiers, uh, soon to be infinite. Uh, we have multiple protocol versions. Uh, we have, I don't know, seven to 10-ish chains. I've kind of lost track of chain deploys. Um, we have you know, all these problems around front running and MEV and trade-offs between you know, uh, gas-related trade-offs. So it's a really complicated problem. Um, and then one we've been you know, looking to tackle head-on, uh, something we've been working on for, for a while now. Um, so excited to announce a, a project called Uniswap X. Uh, it is a new phone. <laughs> um, no, it is a auction-based routing protocol. Um, so you know, how, does, how does Uniswap X work? Basically, and we'll get into some of the benefits in a second, but Uniswap X basically works by, you know, all, all orders uh, now start off as off-chain signatures. Uh, today, most orders are, you know, are, are transactions that are submitted directly. These are off-chain signatures, uh, which we are calling Dutch orders. So these orders are essentially auctions. Um, the price, you sign an order that says, this is the price I'm willing to accept, and that price goes down a little bit over time, um, attempting to, you know, optimize the price that you get. Uh, so the price decays until a transaction is filled or it times out. Um, you know, there is a, a new party of, of users. These are actually kind of old users in disguise uh, called fillers. Uh, they compete to fill the order first against each other. Uh, the people you know, that do this are people that look like block builders, uh, et cetera, today, uh, arbitrageurs uh, arbitra today. Um, and I, I think that the important thing here is that you know, uh, today we have this, this problem of front running an MEV where, uh, you know, often you get the worst rate you're willing to accept rather than the best rate that is available. And that's because you know, people can reorder transactions within a block and move the price. And so by creating, uh, structuring orders as you know, competitive auctions, uh, you, you, you attempt to get the best ra uh, rate that someone can offer, not the worst rate that you're willing to receive. Um, uh, additionally, so auctions take time and having auctions ha happen more quickly, um, uh, there, there can be tricks for that. So, the, the base protocol doesn't, uh, doesn't need this, but there's an optional ability to parameterize these Dutch orders using an RFQ system, which helps the auction happen faster. Um, and so this is sort of what the, the two variants look like. Um, pretty simple, you have you know, a, a, a starting price, um, sort of like the maximum price you might expect to get, um, and then it decays to the minimum price you're willing to receive. But again, uh, the, the sort of way sandwiching works is that you often get the worst price you're willing to receive, and what we expect here is that you will get you know, the best price that is available. Uh, when possible, and you know, uh, complex trade-off space of parameterization, but aside. Um, then with the RFQ variant on the, uh, on the right, um, uh, there is sort of this ability to converge more quickly on the, on the, the uh, initial price, or the expected price. Um, it still is a public auction, so if someone has price improvement on top of the RFQ winner, uh, that price can be overridden. Um, uh, but there is some minimum margin of improvement. 
Um, okay, so what, what is the point of all of this, um, technical aside? Uh, really what we're trying to do is compete, uh, create a competitive marketplace for trade execution. Uh, so today, you know, in front ends, most people use, you know, like, they're, like today in our front end, right, we have like a routing system, it's open source, it's called the auto router. Um, but it's like one team. And I think one of the biggest questions that we had when, uh, you know, Uniswap v4 was announced is, okay, like I create some new custom hook, how does this liquidity get discovered? How, how is it found? Um, and, uh, you know, by creating a competitive marketplace where anyone can compete with each other to, to offer the best routes, uh, we expect that, you know, when there's some new liquidity pool that's created, uh, rather than having to be integrated directly, it can be integrated, instead of like a one of one integration you need, it's a one of N, where any possible, you know, filler uh, can integrate with, with these pools and, and create liquidity. Um, I think just generally, uh, you know, uh, today, Right now, like there is competition to interact with Uniswap trades, but it's competition between block builders trying to extract the maximum value they can. And what we want to create is competition to offer users the best prices. Um, so yeah, you know, it generally acts as you know a way of aggregating on-chain liquidity as well as off-chain liquidity. Um, it, it has some swapping benefits by moving to uh, signed off-chain orders. We can get, you know. Uh, basically a gas-free swapping UX, where you, the, the fillers pay the gas on behalf of the swapper. Um, and so for the, from the swapper, they just have an input token and an output token. So if you're swapping USDC for DAI, you don't need to pay ETH fees. Um, there are some minor caveats around, like, you still have to do token approvals unless your token supports signature-based approves. But we can ignore that. Um, uh, additionally, there is no gas cost for failed transactions, again, because uh, these are just off-chain signatures from, from the user's perspective. Uh, so that is nice. Uh, generally, you know, again, kind of attempts to reduce the amount of value that is extracted by MEV uh, people and, and kind of internalize it, keep as much of the value for the swappers as possible. Um, uh, so there is an opt-in beta live today. Um, it is a slow rollout. So today, when you go to the Uniswap web app, uh, probably right now, um, I, I hope, um, then uh, you, know, you have the option to opt in to, to Uniswap X in settings, or it can pop up on certain trades. Um, it, it's being rolled out slowly, so you know, we, we need time for like, a more diverse ecosystem of fillers to come online, uh, time to test parameterization of the system. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, some trades might start routing through this in, in the short term, and then over time we expect more and more trades, and eventually maybe all, all, all trades, or uh, all, all trades where it can offer price improvement to route through Uniswap X. Um, but that is not all we are announcing today. Uh, we actually have another announcement. Um, so this is Uniswap X, the cross-chain variant. Um, you know, I think that when you move orders, we, we realized when you move orders to signed off-chain messages, it actually enables a really interesting design space for cross-chain. Um, so you know, these, these signed Dutch order you know, uh, trades enable cross-chain swaps and fast L2 exits. So how do we do this? Uh, well, first off, these, these orders can settle over almost any bridge. One way to think about it is it can kind of ignore the, the bridging layer, and, and it sort of works uh, regardless of the, the bridges uh, that exist and can kind of settle over any of them. Um, it also has a seamless UX for swappers. So you know, think the Uniswap you, uh, experience you have today. Um, and uh, that is achieved by having these fillers manage a lot of the complexity and latency. Uh, so a lot of, you know, Today, when you interact with bridges, there are you know, long delays and latency, and today those are borne by users who want to move tokens between chains. But here we can have them, you know, the, the, the delays borne by fillers and swappers just you know, have the, the Uniswap, the classic Uniswap UX. Um, I think a pretty big unlock here is actually native asset swaps. So I think you know, swapping uh, you know, chains native to Ethereum, so like e, or tokens like ETH on Ethereum to you know, OP or Matic or, or you know, uh, you know, native tokens of other chains, uh, AVAX, et cetera. Um, and what this actually does, it reduces exposure to bridge risk. So today, most, uh, you know, the way that most of these, if a lot of people want to move tokens between trades simply because they want to make, or between chains simply because they want to make trades. And what happens, you know, you, you, let's say you, like, my, you, you move your tokens into a bridge that then has a representation of that token on another chain, and then that token is sitting, and then you swap that in like an AMM. Uh, and what that means is that liquidity providers on the other chain are exposed to bridge risk kind of perpetually. Um, with, uh, with this sort of cross-chain design that we have here, uh, bridge risk is really only borne while the transactions are in flight and until they settle. 
And so, and with the native asset swaps, you sort of reduce the amount of tokens that are just sitting idly in bridges, uh, which kind of act as like a bit of a honeypot, and we, we sort of all know uh, the, the bridge space today and, and how that has sort of played out. Um, I can quickly talk through the, um, the life cycle of you know, a, a cross-chain order. Um, so basically, you know, to start, we have a signed order, and the, uh, the, um, you know, it's a normal Dutch order. So fillers are competing. Actually, that's, this is this one. But, uh, fillers are competing to offer the best price for that order. And whoever wins basically in, sits, uh, submits a transaction on the uh, origin chain uh, to basically claim that order. Uh, that locks the swapper's input tokens, uh, right? So we're no, longer, we're no longer synchronous, we are asynchronous. So the swapper's input tokens are now locked in a escrow smart contract on the input chain. Um, and then the filler now has to fill the, the swapper on the uh, destination chain. Uh, so they send the swapper the chain, uh, the, the output tokens on, the, on that chain, and that initiates a message through a bridge which uh, you know, releases the funds back to the filler, the input tokens back to the filler. And so in this way, the bridge latency is borne by this filler, and the swapper can have very quick uh, settlement. Um, now, this, this sort of bridge uh, thing can actually also be further improved, because this proof doesn't need to be, this proof can be optimistic, so rather than waiting for the bridge, you can assume that it was filled unless someone does some sort of challenge. So kind of similar design space to like optimistic roll-ups, where you can have a, an optimistic settlement game here, um, which, which we like. And uh, so, so how does this kind of all work together? I think that like, you know, one thing to think about is that Uniswap v4 is really, you know, aiming to be like this, this really powerful AMM platform for LPs and developers. So you can think about AMMs as ways of creating liquidity um, and ways of building on top of liquidity as, a, as, like, a, as like a primitive, as a money Lego, as, as we call it. And it's not, um, and, and, but, but interacting with AMMs and on-chain liquidity, which is a really powerful force, is something that you, you know, that like is always gonna need a lot of complex logic. Like there's, there's, there's always gonna be like gas issues and MEV and, and there's like a whole design space around this. And so you could think of Uniswap X as like a tackling from, from the other end, how do we optimize trades for swapping? Um, and, and it should be like very highly synergistic with Uniswap V4. Um, so before we have liquidity creation, uh, Uniswap X we have, you know, uh, trade routing, you know, tra uh, trade execution, um, aggregation, and just creating a better user experience for swappers. Um, so this is like a, this is a first step. Uh, I, I really want to highlight this. You know, the, the goal is building this like highly decentralized uh, filler network. Um, there is like a broader ecosystem-wide effort working on very similar project, uh, problems. Um, so, so what we're doing is starting to step into the same space as people who say words like intense and MEV and OFAs and you know, all these conversations on like the routing problem. Um, there's a lot of work to do. It's like a very complex uh, design space that is in, in, in its kind of early days. And there's still a lot of improvements to make over where, where we are today, um, just you know, better scaling. Uh, you know, user privacy, I think privacy is like a really important way for further, um, you know, optimization of, of trade execution. And I, I just want to say like generally we are, at, at Uniswap Labs are really excited to kind of collaborate with all the other teams in the space, you know, projects like Flashbots, et cetera, um, that are working towards these shared goals with us. Um, so uh, sometimes, sometimes we feel like this, um, which is, you know, like what, okay, so like, you know, it's a first step, but it's, you know, a first step towards what? And, uh, you know, I'd say that generally what we're, we're working towards is we want decentralized markets to outcompete centralized ones, and, and there's, there's a reason. Because, you know, decentralized markets, uh, I, I believe, can really achieve much better outcomes for users, uh, far greater transparency, you know, removing central points of failure, central points of control, uh, but also actually competing, you know, creating like more efficient market structures, uh, faster, you know, market structure iteration, um, and uh, just, you know, uh, really creating systems that empower users and, and create like highly competitive products built on top of them. Um, I think maybe like an even understated uh, uh, benefit is like the, the sort of ability for people to build on top uh, without getting kind of like rugged by the platform they're building on. So when you think about like the Twitter API or the Reddit API uh, and, and sort of the changes that happen there, um, but we don't want to do this 
you know, like today, I think people who use decentralized platforms tend to do it because they, uh, you know, care about decentralization. I, I actually believe this. Um, I think that, you know, today it's still like more expensive to use decentralized platforms by a good amount. Market structures are still a little bit less efficient. Um, the user experiences are still much more complicated. And that's not really like a, you know, if we want adoption of decentralized markets, we can't compete, like we have to actually compete kind of like on merit and uh, even for people who don't purely care about decentralization um, in the abstract. Uh, but we need to actually deliver like more tangible value that, that uh, you know, can, can be directly realized. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that the, the important thing here is that like we, we don't, we're not afraid, like, if we want, you know, I, I personally think that like all, in the long run, basically all value should be tokenized, um, all value should be traded on chain, uh, because I think that we can really, you know, memes are the most important form of value, um, clearly. Uh, this is an actual uh, slide from a, a uh, I think the Series B pitch deck, I don't remember which one, um, but, uh, but did not change the size of, the size of memes. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I think that like, you know, in the long run, just having, uh, you know, interoperable systems, having all shared infrastructure for all forms of value um, and having those, these, these markets be, you know, highly decentralized just is, a, is like a far better, more transparent, um, more kind of user aligned world. Um, but if we want to get there, I think that like the market structures that exist today are very far away from where they need to be um, to, to kind of like fully realize this. And so, uh, you know, to me, it's, I'd say that like, you know, in the past, we've kind of like reinvented, you know, we went from Uniswap v2 to Uniswap v3, and it was kind of like a complete like upending of, of how Uniswap worked. And I, I think that like, to me, like stagnation is kind of the, the worst thing. And so uh, what I'm really excited for is to just continue to push at the forefront and, and kind of like innovate on how market structures can and should work. There's like a huge, there's like a huge open field design space here of, you know, Z, ZK proofs and, and, um, and just, uh, you know, further iteration on the like OFA design space. Um, so, that, so that's mostly what I, you know, and, and so like, you know, we can't, I'd say that like, maybe the one final thing is like, I don't think that achieving this outcome is inevitable. I think that like, we can make it happen and like, we should make it happen because I think it's a better world. Um, so excited to do that um, with you all. Uh, it's, it's a group effort. Um, and, and that's mainly what I wanted to talk about. So thank you all. Um, excited to be here. Cool.